Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I assume you can see my screen. I'm going to tell you a little bit about physical phase separation and biological cells. And uh, this is, of course, work I do not alone, but with my group. Here's a picture that we took recently in winter. And here's a list of the current PhD student postdocs, and I will call them out throughout the talk. And uh, we are a theory group, basically all theoretical physicists, but uh, we try to keep connection to reality by collaborating with um, many people around the world. And this is a list of current collaborators, people I talk to quite frequently. So what we are really interested in in the group is the organization of biological cells. And here is a, well, actually a schematic view of a cell, which is actually simplified in, in two ways. On the one hand, it's way too simple in terms of composition. There are many things that are not shown, although it's already, of course, quite full. And also it's a static image and dynamics, of course, not shown here. Uh, but what is clear from this picture, at least to me, is that the biological cells are incredibly complex. And it's actually almost a miracle that anything works at all, as far as I'm concerned. And what is also clear is that much of the bio uh, materials that you see here need to be organized in space and also time. And much of this organization on a large scale happens through membranes, like you can see the plasma membrane here, and also the mitochondrial membrane, ER, and so on. Um, but uh, it's also clear that just the thing that these proteins interact, that these biomolecules interact, leads to additional organization. And then in the last 10, 15 years, people identified many uh, phase separated condensates actually in these cells. So these are regions where a certain kind of protein or a set of proteins is highly enriched as compared to their surrounding. And here, this is from a review from a few years ago, uh, basically trying to illustrate that these condensates appear all over the cell, participate in virtually all cellular functions, not quite diverse. And actually also many diseases associated with that. Now, this is a big news, basically, in biology, in cell biology in particular. But I guess from a physical point of view, it shouldn't surprise us, really, that in a very multi-component mixture of interacting particles, um, you can easily phase separate. Like the, the argument, the simplest argument you can make is that there are simply many more states where you distribute the material heterogeneously. So you concentrate some material in one region and dilute it in others. So uh, and, and because there are many of these states, it's quite likely that some of these states have lower free energy than the homogeneous mixture. And this can be made much more concrete uh, in a few papers down here that make this argument. So I would actually argue from a physical point of view that it's extremely likely that phase separation happens and the challenge for a cell might actually be to prevent it and actually keep the system somewhat fluid-like. But another interesting aspect here is that phase separation is uh, an inherent property of these systems. And on the other hand, as I argued earlier, cells need to spatially organize their molecules. So it might make sense to combine this and actually exploit phase separation to form these condensates. And this is actually how I think about the system. And then the challenge and question becomes how cells can control this phase separation. And this is really the question that we're trying to work on in the group. Like what physical processes can you exploit to, for instance, control how large droplets get, where they form, and, and how they move around. So the plan for the talk today actually is to uh, show you three different aspects of uh, work we've done in the group, but I thought it would also be useful to actually quickly recap the, the basic physical phase separation, because I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. So just briefly, phase separation is basically a, <clears throat> a physical process which can be thought of as um, originating from weak interactions, weak motivated interactions between molecules, so here indicated by these blue dots, and um, if you bring these together in a region of high concentration, you, of course, reduce the overall entropy of the system, the translation entropy of these molecules, but you gain an enthalpy because of this interaction. And so and if this interaction is strong enough, the overall free energy can be lower as compared to the mixed state. And this is really the region for phase separation. Now, the molecules at the surface are not quite happy. They are not surrounded by all their friends, and also they don't have enjoy the entropy of the dilute phase, so there's actually an energy penalty you need to pay to make an interface, which shows up as surface energy or surface tension. And the system then needs to, or wants to reduce this overall surface, which leads to round droplets in the first place. And this surface tension not only controls the shape of these droplets, but also has an interesting effect when you compare multiple droplets in the same system, because the surface to volume ratio of droplets of different sizes, of course, is different. And that implies that these smaller droplets are actually energetically less favorable. Like in a thermodynamic equilibrium, you would only expect one large phase. 
And one additional consequence then is that these smaller droplets actually have a higher a pressure inside, a blast pressure, which goes like one of the radius. And that implies that the coexisting concentrations here at the interface actually are elevated according to this model. And that then means, and the consequence that you have a higher concentration outside smaller droplets as compared to larger droplets, implying a concentration gradient and therefore diffusive fluxes, which go from the small droplet to the large droplet and transport material in this direction. And the consequence of that is then that you have a coarsening process much like shown here in the simulation where all the small droplets disappear uh, and the large droplets grow. And this is known as oxide ripening and this is a consequence of surface tension, which is in itself a consequence of phase separation. So when I think about a passive system, this is what I expect. This is the classical physics of phase separation. And I think uh, this is not what we often observe. Actually, this is hardly ever observed in biology. And what I now wanna, do for the rest of the talk is to basically show you additional effects that are important in biology that we think about and actually modify this picture tremendously. So in essence, I wanna name three challenges that biology poses to us theorists that we need to add to understand how phase separation actually plays out in biology. And the first thing I wanna talk about is actually multi-component phase separation. Because what I showed so far is just one blue particle trying to mix from the surrounding but surely biology uh, has much more complicated situations and there are probably thousands if not 10,000 of different kinds of molecules in a typical biological cell. So we're working on this. Um, another crucial aspect of phase separation in biology is that um, the material properties are not always liquid-like. It's not in the simple state, but we have long polymers which can easily extend, which can easily tangle up or they can even cross-link. So we have, significant elastic properties. For instance, you can think of the cytoskeleton, right? If you want to make a condensate inside the cell, you need to maybe displace the cytoskeleton. And also the droplets themselves can possess elastic properties. That's the second part I want to talk about. And lastly, and probably most importantly, um, biological cells are alive, meaning that there are some process which drives them away from equilibrium. And the simplest process that we actually study is simply one where you add chemical reactions. So basically you modify the molecules um, to have different physical interactions with the surrounding. That's the third part. So that's the rough plan. Um, and I try to keep within the 25 minutes. So I will only uh, scratch the surface of each of these topics. Um, okay, let's start with multi-component mixtures. Just to illustrate the example. So I'm abstracting away a lot of complications that actually cells have. I'm considering a fixed volume, which is uh, basically to replace the cell and place a few particles in there. For illustration here, I picked four different kinds of particles and assuming that they all somehow interact. And then of course, how they interact will dictate what happens in thermodynamic equilibrium. And if you have four particles, there are basically six kinds of interactions you need to specify. Um, and here for illustrative purposes, I assume that particle one and four and two and three attract uh, each other respectively where all other uh, interactions are repulsive. And if I do this, then, uh, well, you might not be surprised to hear that the particles associate according to their uh, label, right? The one of four coexists in one phase and the other one, two particles coexist in another phase. Very easy. Now, of course, this is just schematics. You want to be quantitative. You want to derive a physical theory for that. We need to quantify what's going on. And the way this is typically done is by introducing these Florian parameters, uh, which basically are um, negative for attraction and positive for repulsion. If you do that, we can summarize this whole thing in a nice interaction matrix, which needs to be symmetric because we are um, just uh, discussing equilibrium reciprocal interactions. Okay, and the question now basically is, how does this interaction matrix, which can have, which encodes the real physical interaction of all these particles, how does that inform phase separation? What's really happening there? And to show you also some equation, this is basically uh, associated with simple flory huckens model, which is called phase separation, which just comprises the translation entropy of these molecules and the solvent. And the interactions are here written in the lowest order form, where this interaction matrix is the sky matrix and we have a quadratic form. This is a standard model and it works well for multi-component systems. And from that, we can derive chemical tensions and pressures. And you know that in equilibrium, both the chemical potentials and the pressures need to be equalized at standard equilibrium thermodynamics. And you need to do this for all phases because when you have many components, you can in principle have um, many phases. In fact, Gibbs phase, rule, Gibbs phase rule tells us that we have, can have as many phases as components. 
Now, this is all traditionally known. It's, it's not very complicated. What becomes complicated is actually solving these equations because this is a nonlinear for energy. The chemical potentials are nonlinear. And we need to solve potentially quite many of these equations. And it's not easy to do. For instance, in this example, we actually already have five equations that we need to solve. Um, and for five unknowns, namely the, the composition of one phase and the size of one phase, the other ones are constrained uh, by conservation laws. And basically what I want to say here is that we developed a new algorithm. In fact, Yi Cheng and Sheng Ji, two postdocs in the group, developed a new algorithm based on free energy minimization of which we can solve these coexistence problem. And we just used it in a recent manuscript to start with the simplest thing we can think of, which is just to ask how many phases actually form uh, when I look at random interaction matrices. And we simply looked at random matrices because we then just have two parameters to vary. And what we could identify is first of all, we can do the numerics with this algorithm, which is super nice. But more importantly, we now can also derive scaling laws of how the number of phases actually scales with the number of components, which was not possible before. What was done before is actually scaling law based on linear stability analysis, which is the, the shaded, like the light shaded the, uh, area in the back. Um, and it turns out that the phase count actually scales logarithmically with the com uh, number of components, whereas the, the number of unstable modes uh, scales very differently. And we can also do the same analysis for uh, the variation. So this was done for the, uh, for the mean strength of the interactions. We can also look at the variation. We get another collapse, but again, the logarithmic contribution actually dominates. So what this is telling us that is that even for quite weak interactions, you can easily separate into multiple many phases um, when you have many components, uh, whereas the homogeneous state is actually quite stable. And this implies in turn that there's a huge nucleation growth regime in these multi-component mixtures where potentially um, many different coexisting uh, states and you can have uh, droplets nucleate of a very different kind. This is something you wanna explore further in the future. But the, the two things basically I want to stress here, one is that we have actually now for the first time scaling predictions for the phase count in the simple case of random interaction matrices. And also we have a numerical algorithm, which we are now going to exploit for the coming years to understand this multi-component phase separation in much more detail. All right, so I want to come back to my basic table of contents and uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about material properties and phase separation in elastic matrices. And the motivation for that actually comes from biology again. Our collaborator Eric Dufresne, who's now in Cornell, actually looks at, for instance, stress granules, which are little droplets uh, that form inside cells under stress conditions. And these typically form within the cytoskeleton, which you can see here in form of microtubuli in green. And then it's clear if you want to form these droplets, you need to, need to make space for these, right? And that potentially you need to deform the mesh or at least the droplets can't grow much larger than the mesh size. Now we don't understand this system very well at all because it's very complicated, it's multi-component again, it's also active and so on and so forth. So what we actually started out doing first is to analyze another system that's also studied in Eric's lab. And that's a synthetic system where you just form oil droplets in PDMS matrices. And the interesting experiment that I wanna tell you about is one where you basically make the PDMS at the room temperature, you heat it up a little bit, and you swell it in a different oil. So you now have two oils which are miscible at high temperature. And if you now lower the temperature of the whole system, the two oils become immiscible, immiscible they phase separate. The PDMS itself actually, or the gel itself, prefers one of the two oils so that the other oil forms little droplets or these labyrinth-like structures inside the gel. And this interesting observation that Eric had was that uh, you form quite regular structures in this map. So, so, and also these structures are on the, uh, comparable to the wavelength of light, which makes them optically very interesting. Now we wanted to understand this. And we set out to actually explain, a, um, and we did, to derive an equilibrium theory, which just combines phase separation against the flory huckens system, binary in this case. We added some elasticity theory, just saying basically that uh, if you stretch uh, the, the, the mesh, because of phase separation and you accrue some elastic energy. And so we just took the simple phase separation energy, we took simple elasticity theory, and we found that this doesn't work at all. So we could actually prove after some tinkering that with normal elasticity theory based on gradient uh, tenses, you cannot have any periodic structure. The system would always go to macroscopic phase separation, even if you lose nonlinear elasticity. 
And that got us actually uh, thinking. And it turned out that we needed to adjust the elasticity theory that we use. And we finally ended up using what is known as non-local elasticity theory. And the difference really is that um, you don't build the energy of the uh, elastic material just based on the local strain, but we use uh, a non-local strain, which then leads to non-local stress like here, uh, based on a simple convolution of the local strain field. So the idea is, when just running through equations, you convolve the strain field with a kernel, We here chose a Gaussian kernel, which gives us a length scale, and then you have a non-local strain field and that you use to build your elastic energy. And the motivation for that is that once you zoom into an elastic mesh, you actually see the elements and they have a particular size, right? These strands, these polymer strands. And if you move one of the cross links, it actually gonna register a certain distance away. And it's not clear at this point, or actually we could show that it's not sufficient to just use it, in, uh, look at infinitesimal um, diff distances which one does with normal elasticity theory. So we need to fix this somehow. And it turns out when you use this non-local version, you just get one extra parameter. If you look at phenomena that are on length scales large compared to this microscopic length scale, then this reduces to normal local elasticity because this is so peaked. But uh, if, if the phenomena that you observe or are interested in are comparable to this length scale, then this actually leads to very different effects. And indeed, we could find patterns uh, in our minimization. And here, I just want to briefly show the phase diagram. So these are two times the same system. Here, we show the pattern length scale. Here, the amplitude as a function of interaction strength. So how deeply you quench. Temperature basically goes in this direction. Like if, so higher temperature are, are down here, lower temperatures are up here. And so if you quench, we basically go the, through this direction. And the x-axis shows the fraction of the elastic components, much, how much material we have there. And there are a number of interesting observations. First of all, there's a pattern phase, which is exactly um, connected to what we observe in experiments. Secondly, we actually predict coexistence between a pattern phase and a homogeneous phase, much like we would in ordinary phase separation. But most importantly, we also find a continuous phase transition now, which is indicated by this red dotted line. Um, and this is actually surprising for phase separating system because normally you have, you have a first order phase transition where once you cross the um, saturation concentration, uh, or the binodal more generally, then you expect the contrast to basically jump to, the, to very high values because uh, the coexisting phases have set uh, compositions. But here, the contrast comes up slowly, as shown by its amplitude, we have a continuous phase transition, which was seen in, uh, in experiments. This is why I'm stressing this so much. Um, all right, so that's what we learn from this system that actually, if I zoom out a little bit, what we learn from this system is that if you want to study um, phenomena on length scale that are comparable to the mesh size or a little bit larger than mesh size, you actually might, to might need to modify your elasticity theory to incorporate some information about the mesh size, which we do with this non-local elasticity. There might be other ways to do it, but I think it's important to think about this, that you cannot always use these macroscopic elastic fields. So the bottom line, going back to schematics, is that if you form such a droplet in an elastic mesh, the mesh exerts an extra pressure on it, and you need to think about how this exactly happens. And another consequence actually happens when you have heterogeneities in the mesh on long length scales. So it's illustrated here, where I have a soft uh, mesh on the right and uh, left and a stiff mesh on the right. And now in the simplest case, I exert a higher pressure from the stiffer mesh, right? That's the naive assumption. And I told you earlier already that higher pressures lead to higher coexistence concentrations and diffusive fluxes. And the same thing that applied to Oswald ripening earlier also applies to this system. And together with Eric Dufresne's group again, we then took this elastic ripening because it's ripening which is driven elastically. And this simple assumption actually allowed us to explain another experiment that Eric did, where again, they have the same system, PDMS, uh, oil droplets induced by lowering the temperature. Now the difference here is that the PDMS less, uh, stiffness is low on the left and high on the right. And when, now we actually look at the microscope image right after quenching. And then if you let the system sit there, actually all the droplets in the stiff side dissolve and the, the droplets on the soft side grow a little bit. And this is exactly due to this elastic ripening. So I would argue that it's actually in these systems, not only in the synthetic system, but also in the biology, important to think about heterogeneity on short length scale 
which could give rise to these periodic patterns, and also heterogeneities on a long line of scale, which can actually give rise to this elastic ripening. Good. And last but not least, um, I want to talk about the interesting effects of non-equilibrium. And here, I want to contrast two situations. On the left-hand side, I'm going to show this video again of Oswald Ripen that you've seen before. And on the right-hand side, I want to show a video that was taken in Tony Hyman's lab in Dresden, um, where we're going to observe the, the first division of some embryonic cell. Uh, and here, they label one protein, which apparently uh, accumulates in these little clusters, which are actually condensates. So I want to play the Moody's side by side. On the left-hand side, we see author ripening. On the right-hand side, something very different happens. These condensates grow, and they actually dissolve right prior to cell division. Now we have two daughter cells, and each daughter cell makes a pair of droplets again. And you can see that this is qualitatively different than what we expect from a phase separating system. In particular, this cyclic growth and dissolution cycle is synchronized with the cell cycle. And within each cell, you have droplets of exactly the same size, despite this small length scale where you would expect thermal fluctuations to matter. So I don't have the time to tell you the details of this model. I actually spent almost my entire PhD trying to explain what this is. But it turns out that chemical transitions are key here. I mean, you um, that kinases and, and ADP are important for this process. So instead of explaining this exact model, I thought it was better to just explain or show the simplest effect that chemical reactions, driven chemical reactions can have on a phase separating system. And the simplest thing I can imagine is one system where I have a binary solution that phase separates, much like here on the left. But now I allow the two species to turn into each other with set rates. So I just impose some rates, first order. Um, and when I simulate that, I also get phase separation. I get an initial small coarsening phase. But quite quickly afterwards, this coarsening is suppressed and completely arrested. And all the droplets seem to have the same size and they range in a sort of hexagonal lattice. That's curious. And it's a hallmark um, that somehow this also driving driven by surface tension is suppressed. And I should state that this is actually a non-equilibrium system for reasons um, I don't have time to go into. But I just want to give you a brief understanding of where this control droplet size comes from. And it's actually quite easy to do. And again, I can do this in the schematic. So basically the situation we are in is that I have a droplet, a phase separator from a surrounding solvent. And then these two phases are enriched in respective components, A and B. And so for instance, when you focus on a solvent, um, this chemical reaction is gonna run from left to right because there's basically only this soluble form A here. So the reaction can only produce B. But this component B actually doesn't wanna stay here because it wants to phase separate. So it will lead to a diffusive flux toward droplets. And the converse is happening inside the tropic because this is, in that sense, symmetric. So inside the tropic, we have mostly B. The reaction runs from right to left. We produce this soluble component A, which doesn't want to be in the tropic because it wants to phase separate, so it moves out. And so you get cyclic fluxes, which is, of course, also a hallmark of non-equilibrium systems. And what's basically happening here is that we use chemical energy, which is used to drive the reactions in the way we want, to then convert this into diffusive fluxes, which actually can generate motion in the system. And this is key. And we can see that this leads to a controlled droplet size. When we look at how these fluxes scale with the droplet size, uh, in the simplest situation where these droplets are small compared to the surrounding, the influx will be diffusion limited, and thus the integrated flux over the surface in the 3D system scales like the radius, whereas the flux is reaction limited by this reaction, which happens in an entire volume. So the flux scales with R to the cube. And uh, the crop of growth is actually given by the net flux, so the difference of these two. So if you plot the growth rate as a function of radius, uh, for small radii, the influx dominates, droplets grow. For large radii, the flux dominates, droplets shrink. And in between, there's a st stationary state. Um, we can calculate this, and we actually find in this limit that I was talking about that this droplet radius is given by a reaction diffusion length scale. So it's also similar to Turing patterns in some sense. And that's actually something which we're trying to make more precise now and explore in more detail. In a real dense system, this scaling can be actually modified. And one other thing, the final thing I want to show, we found is actually that in this very same system where we have first order reactions, we also find a shape instability where droplets divide spontaneously. And this is also something we can actually explain by these diffusive influxes, which are driven by the chemical reactions. Um, there's maybe one more thing I can show that comes uh, about for sessile droplets, where you basically have a contact potential at a wall, 
droplets want to sit there, we're here looking at rather neutral walls. So the contact angle is close to 90 degrees. But if we have on top of this, this chemical activity and diffusive fluxes, the, the wall actually breaks the symmetry tremendously and the fluxes become very isometric. So we can get these pancake-like shapes, um, which look nothing like the spherical caps that you expect in a passive system. Okay, with that, uh, I quickly run to my summary slide. I basically showed you three different things. One on the hand, um, I'm talking about multi-component mixtures and how they have complex phase diagrams, which you're beginning to explore with new numerical method. We just started to look at scaling um, of phase counts for now. We're also interested in these droplets that form an elastic meshes. We have other work where we actually make the droplets themselves viscoelastic. And finally, I talked very briefly about these driven chemical reactions, now they can control droplet size. They can also control nucleation and where these droplets form, which is something I didn't talk about. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and I'm looking forward to questions.